And now it's the ATF. Except with the ATF, they don't even claim to be experts. The director said so last week. Last week in a hearing in front of Congress in the Appropriations Committee, he was asked about firearms. He said, I'm not an expert in firearms. Not an expert, but still trying to run Americans' lives. You would think the head of the agency tasked with regulating the entire firearms industry, a constitutionally protected industry, would know something about firearms. Earlier this year, the ATF issued a rule that unilaterally puts new restrictions on Second Amendment rights. This rule redefined firearms with stabilizing braces as short-barreled rifles so that they could be controlled under the Gun Control Act of 1968, the National Firearms Act of 1934. There are approximately 40 million firearms with stabilizing braces currently in circulation. The pistol brace was created for use by disabled person, including disabled veterans. These individuals could lose the ability to use these tools and as a result may not be able to operate their firearm. Under the new rule, these firearm owners will be required to obtain special registration, surrender or destroy their brace by the compliance date, or they will face severe criminal penalties. This is not the result of a decision made by Congress. Congress didn't change the law. No bill was introduced in this committee, passed by this committee, passed by the House, passed by the Senate, and signed by the President. Nope. This rule turns law-abiding gun owners into felons is a result of unelected bureaucrats simply enacting a new regulation. And that's not how it's supposed to work in our great country. Congress writes the laws and the executive branch enforces them. Here the executive branch has taken power from Congress in deciding what the law should be and that change and that they change themselves with enforcing, charge themselves with enforcing, excuse me. Director Dettelbach has in essence become a one-man Congress. Notably, this decision runs counter to the ATF decision under President Obama in 2012 that a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace was, quote, would not be subject to the National Firearms Act and those controls. An independent analysis of financial harm to the firearms industry from the pistol brace ban has been estimated to exceed a billion dollars. Law-abiding firearm owners relied on this ruling for a decade before having the rug pulled out from under them this year by Director Dettelbach's ATF. And it's not just with the stabilizing brace rule that the ATF is attacking the Second Amendment. They've also targeted firearms businesses by creating pretenses to shut them down. The new classifications are left purposely broad and allow the ATF to revoke the license, licenses of FFLs for simple technical and non-material paperwork violations. In 2022, ATF revoked over 90 licenses more than any year since 2006. This is an attack on the Second Amendment, pure and simple, plain and simple. And I want to thank Director Edelbach for appearing before us today, and we look forward to hearing from him and his taking our questions. With that, I would yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by first apologizing for the uh, slander we heard this morning directed at one of the great public servants of our time, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Mr. Chairman, Violence continues to take the lives of more than 100 Americans every single day. It changes how safe we feel in our homes, in our schools, and in our houses of worship. It reduces vibrant cities to somber headlines. It takes our loved ones, old and young, and leaves us with another anniversary of lives cut short and a community forever traumatized. We have already lost more than 13,000 Americans to gun deaths so far this year including 80 young children, 469 teens, and 18 law enforcement officers. We are the only nation in the industrialized world that tolerates such gruesome statistics. It's against this sobering background that Republicans have called this hearing to criticize the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the law enforcement agency tasked with keeping guns out of the wrong hands. At least Republicans are transparent about their goal to pressure, intimidate, and hamstring the agency so that it can no longer effectively do its job and protect Americans from violent crime. Some Republicans have even introduced a bill to abolish the ATF altogether. That's right. They seek to eliminate the law enforcement agency responsible for protecting communities from gun violence, 
stopping gun trafficking, and ensuring lawful and responsible gun ownership. Local law enforcement depends on the ATF to provide resources that help them solve crimes and prevent gun violence. In a recent President's message in Police Chief Magazine, International Association of Chiefs of Police President John Latenny encourages fellow police chiefs to, quote, take advantage of the no-cost systems offered by the ATF to help investigate and ultimately remove dangerous weapons from our communities, close quote. He noted that, quote, ATF has the only gun tracing platform in the United States that can be used by local, state, federal, and global law enforcement agencies to investigate criminal gun activity, close quote. ATF also runs the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, which provides local, state, tribal, and federal law enforcement at no cost with ballistic imaging, a critical tool that can help solve crime and prevent further gun violence. ATF also carries out its mission by lending its expertise, such as by classifying weapons, advising prosecutors, and promulgating regulations, and by collaborating with various law enforcement agencies. As Chief Oteni explains, collaboration can improve overall violence reduction strategies while allowing each piece of the system to focus on what they do best. Clearly, the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police sees the great value that ATF provides. But some Republicans seek to abolish this agency and to end the work that it does to, to make Americans safer. Other Republicans merely seek to starve the agency of funding, to place additional restrictions on the use of its data to help solve crimes and keep the community safe, or to dismantle its regulations. In fact, just last week, this committee voted to prevent the ATF from regulating stabilizing braces, a device used in multiple mass shootings, including most recently in Nashville, to convert a pistol into a more dangerous short-barreled rifle. We just heard the chairman excoriate the ATF by saying it adopted this rule on gun braces without congressional action, without the Senate, the House, and the President signing it. Well, that's the function of any executive agency entrusted by Congress with making rules. How can it be that the majority says it stands with law enforcement, yet it seeks to abolish the only law enforcement agency with the, with the capability of tracing gun crimes, of tracing crime guns, I should say? How can the majority say that they support state and local police while attempting to hamstring and starve the agency that provides them with so many critical resources for solving crime, including homicides, gun trafficking, and organized crime? The answer lies in another part of ATF's responsibilities, making sure that gun dealers follow the law by conducting background checks, refusing to sell to those who are not allowed to have firearms, and keeping records so that gu crime guns can be traced. The overwhelming majority of gun sellers have no problem following these laws. But when gun dealers willfully refuse to follow them, it is ATF's responsibility to revoke their license to sell. The ATF upheld that responsibility last year, revoking 92 licenses for gun sellers with serious willful violations, a tiny fraction of the over 130,000 licensed firearm dealers. But gun groups cried foul, claiming that such revocations are crushing gun sellers, revoking 92 out of, three, out of 130,000 licenses. And then Republicans introduced legislation to abolish the ATF. Republicans' priorities are clear. They would prefer to keep every gun store in the country open, even those that willfully violate the law, rather than to let ATF save lives simply by enforcing the law. It is essential that we conduct oversight of our agencies to ensure that they are fulfilling their missions. But today's hearing makes no attempt to fulfill that responsibility. Instead, it shows how radically out of step my Republican colleagues are with the American people, with law enforcement, and even with many responsible gun owners. Democrats have put forth a range of solutions to prevent gun violence, to support law enforcement, and to solve crimes. But our colleagues across the aisle continue to push for unfettered access to assault weapons, concealable rifles, and ghost guns. As Republicans continue to seek freedom from gun regulation, we will continue to seek communities free from gun violence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back without objection. All of their opening statements will be included in the record. By the time the rule was issued, the brace designs had changed dramatically, so they weren't dealing with the same thing. Uh, Mr. Be Dettelbach, despite the complaints of my colleagues across the aisle, Congress and the Attorney General have delegated to ATF the authority to issue rules and regulations to enforce the provisions of the National Firearms Act of 1934 and the Gun Control Act of 1968. Does ATF's rulemaking authority include the authority to clarify or interpret terms used in those statutes? ATF uh, was delegated rulemaking authority by Congress, yes. and we can, we, we can do that, yes. And is this any different from the authority given to other executive agencies? Uh, Congress determines the amount of authority given, but it is not uncommon to have the kind of rulemaking authority that Congress has decided to give to ATF. Thank you. Is ATF also often called upon to apply those statutes to new technologies developed by the gun industry? Uh, when new technologies uh, develop, sometimes ATF is called upon to evaluate them and to apply Congress's rules to new technologies, yes. Thank you. For how long has ATF been doing the work of interpreting and clarifying statutes p passed by Congress regarding firearms? Um, since uh, before it was even called ATF, right? So, so back in the 1930s when, in, when Congress passed the National Firearms Act, it delegated to, ATF, to what was then the Treasury Department, I believe, of rulemaking authority, and that rulemaking authority has been delegated in other statutes by Congress. So for 70 years, basically. Probably uh, closer to 100. Okay. In deciding how to apply those statutes to emerging technologies, does ATF rely on the expertise of technological experts as well as legal counsel? Uh, ATF uses all its resources and employees and expertise to follow the law as Congress has passed it and to implement those laws to protect the American people. The gun industry has a history of developing new technologies aimed at uh, circumventing the nation's firearms. Technologies such as bump stocks, ghost guns, and stabilizing braces. Can you please explain how ATF determines when it is necessary to publish a notice of proposed rulemaking to clarify how statutory terms apply to emerging technologies? Um, so uh, at ATF, uh, we obviously are looking at uh, violent crime. We're looking at public safety issues. Uh, and, and we're also looking, as you said, at changes in uh, behavior and we're trying to apply uh, the, the laws as Congress passes them to a dynamic public safety and, and to new products that come out. Uh, it's not so much our concern what the motivation behind those products are, uh, uh, but we do have to apply the law as Congress wrote it uh, to the current situation faced by the American public. Uh, that's what we try to do our best at ATF. We look at all the factors out there. We look at the, the public safety threat. Uh, and we try to do our best to, to, to take the language Congress wrote and to apply it to individual situations to enforce the law. Thank you. What would happen to ATF and the agency's ability to accomplish its mission if funding is cut, particularly considering the recent surge in gun violence and the years-long boom in firearm purchases? ATF is a small agency with an immense mission, protecting people from violent crime and we work very closely with state and local law enforcement. Cuts to, we do, we're not a large agency, there's not a lot of fat. You're cutting into bone. It would mean task force officers pulled from homicide units solving murder cases. It would mean carjacking cases and killings going unsolved. It would mean us not helping local law enforcement on gang task forces, working on cartel matters, uh, us not being able to respond to firearms dealers, mass shooters. Uh, there's a variety of important public safety things uh, that ATF stretch, stretch very thin to do as it is now. And what could ATF accomplish with greater resources? With greater resources, all of those things I talked about, uh, helping to catch shooters and trigger pullers with local law enforcement, uh, helping to try and make sure we're getting to them the crime gun intelligence they need to see who are the trigger pullers, who are the worst of the worst, and how can we work together to catch them and put them in jail. We could do more uh, to support them. Everywhere I go in this country, um, I talk to chiefs, sheriffs, uh, community members. And it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the country or on a coast, in a, in a sheriff's department, in a rural area, or on a suburb or in a city. They all say the same thing to me, all of them. Send us more ATF resources so we can help fight violent crime. Uh, that's what we would do with those resources. Thank you. My last question, in what ways does ATF work with state, local, and international law enforcement agencies 
to protect the American public from gun violence. We work every day, all the time, shoulder to shoulder with them as they run into the gunfire to protect our communities. These local law enforcement people who work with us at ATF together are courageous people, they're heroes, and they deserve it. And himself mischaracterizing that immunity provision that's contained in the statute. And, and I think the public would benefit from our setting the record straight on the issue. So, Mr. Dettelbach, as the director of ATF, do you, do you agree with President Biden that this law's broad immunity means blanket immunity and that gun manufacturers are the only industry in America exempted from being sued by the public? Uh, again, I think the president has given numerous different uh, times he's talked about this provision. Um, and uh, again, as ATF director, what comes, what Congress passes is what we deal with. And we don't do civil okay, litigation so, in that sense. So you anyway. do, you, that's not then, under our, if that's true and you're going to do what Congress says, then obviously you don't agree with the president. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but that's, that's what that means. Uh, I think the president has called on Congress to act. And what I'm saying is, just, just answer director, this question. I take what comes as you on. interpret the statute, I assume you're familiar with the statute. Uh, I'm familiar with the statute, but ATF doesn't do civil uh, uh, litigation I, I know, liability I know in that, that sense. It's not I, I, yes, sir, I know, but you're the director of ATF. You're familiar, for example, that vaccine manufacturers have uh, some liability exemption for their COVID vaccines, right? I, I actually am not familiar with vaccine law. Well, okay, law, most so. Americans are. Big tech companies are exempt from liability due to Section 230. Do you have any familiarity with that? Uh, I've obviously... as. Probably who reads the news, I know about the, that. The, but point I, is, I, the point is, the president has grossly overstated what this statute does. And since you're not familiar with the statute, apparently, let me tell you that um, some of the exemptions, the limited exemptions, are negligence, knowingly selling to somebody who's not allowed to have a firearm, uh, knowingly making false records, that kind of thing. It is not a blanket immunity, and we need you to be clear about that because the president intentionally or unintentionally is misleading the public on it. Let me move to something else. The stabilizing brace rule as finalized this year, is about set to go into effect in the 1st of June. There's been some discussion about it this morning, but I think most of the American people are not yet aware because the mainstream media is not covering this issue. But here's the facts. Due to ATF's unilateral and unconstitutional action, okay, if you own a stabilizing brace, you're required to register it with ATF, turn it in or destroy it by May 31st, or you're going to face criminal penalties. Mr. Dettelbeck, as an attorney, I'm assuming you know what a reliance interest is, right? Familiar with the term? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm in agreement with your characterization. Of you the know the term and, reliance interest. I'm not playing games here. Uh, I'm not trying to either. I'm trying to be respectful. I, I'm in disagreement with your summary of what the... I haven't summarized is. it yet. I'm asking you if you know the term. Uh, about what you said. I'm sorry. About what, is a, what is a reliance interest? You were a federal prosecutor. Okay. What's a reliance so, so, interest? Well, we don't use it in federal prosecution, but from being a lawyer, mm -hmm. reliance generally, I think, from my days in contracts and as a, and as a civil litigator... Uh, re refers to the idea that in contract law, when somebody uh, relies to their detriment on certain kinds of uh, matters, that they have some legal claims that they might not otherwise have. Excellent. It's not just confined to contract law, but um, as a lawyer and knowing that definition, knowing the concept, I mean, does it concern you that for years law-abiding Americans relied on the ATF's guidance in purchasing stabilizing braces, and now due to a regulation, not a law passed by Congress, but a regulation, millions of them are going to suddenly become felons. Um, first of all, the law doesn't either uh, ban anything, nor, uh, the, the, nor uh, does the rule apply to all stabilizing braces. Uh, the rule under the National Firearms Act uh, helps define uh, and clarify what the characteristics of a firearm okay, that would but be a with your clear rifle. With your clarification, is it true or not that millions of Americans will be defined as felons after May 31 if they don't follow this new regulation? True or not? I assume that people are going to either detach the weapons, follow the things... If they don't the follow the regulation, they'll be a felon, right? You're, you're a former I, I, federal prosecutor. Yeah, I, and, 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 yeah. I, and, I, and I will tell you... That, uh, that federal prosecutions do not happen with respect to law-abiding people who can't have a criminal intent okay, established, okay. Uh, that that is not a priority. Okay, here's, here's the problem we have. But, here's the problem we have, okay? You ran for Ohio Attorney General in 2018. Your platform included gun control. We know where you stand, right? As, as recently as 10 minutes ago, Ms. Jackson Lee, you couldn't answer or define what an, a so-called assault weapon is. You continued to not be able to do that or refused to do it. Uh, it's clear that you came to ATF with an agenda I believe, to infringe upon good law-abiding Americans' rights. And you're going to turn them into criminals with this regulation, and you seem to have no remorse about it. I'm out of time, and I yield back. Uh, 
with respect to you know, yields, I didn't ask you a sorry. question. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the, the other Mr. Johnson from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the uh, folks from Demand, Moms Demand Action uh, for showing up today uh, in their red uh, T-shirts with Moms Demand Action on them. And they are not just sprinkled, but they're dominating the uh, audience out here. So your presence is notable. Thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, director Dettelback, uh, you're the first permanent director of the ATF since 2015, uh, almost eight years ago. Isn't that correct? The first presidentially appointed Senate confirmed director, yes. And you didn't get a single Republican vote during your confirmation process, did you? Uh, that's actually not correct. Well, you uh, might have gotten one. Uh, I, think, I think I received uh, uh, two votes. Two votes. For my Just confirmation from two votes. Senators. Yeah. And, um, and tell me this, sir. You've heard of the MAGA Republican calls to defund the ATF, have you not? Uh, I, I have obviously heard of calls uh, and, to and, defund and, and, law enforcement and, and, and defund and, ATF. I, and, I and let not... me ask you this, sir. Let me ask you this. The major functions of the ATF are to reduce the risk of the risk to public safety caused by illegal firearms trafficking, correct? It's to get shooters off the street and cut off the unlawful throw firearms that, that enable them to kill people. And also a function of the uh, ATF, a major function is to reduce the risk to public safety caused by criminal possession and use of firearms, correct? That's also one of the things we work on, yes. And you improve public safety by increasing compliance with federal laws and regulations by firearms industry members, correct? That's what Congress has uh, tasked us with doing. Sir, you are aware of the fact that gun violence is on the increase in this country, correct? Uh, the gun violence problem is very significant all over this country. What would be the impact branch? No guns were lost. They were stolen by an individual who's now in prison Right. Uh, who was right. not and an right. ATF employee. But there were recommendations made on what you should do so that you don't become the victim of the theft. And the inspector general saying, you're not following them. I'm quoting directly from the inspector general's report. Thousands of firearms, firearms, parts, and ammunition had been stolen from the ATF. So you gave testimony that the brave ATF agents are the ones showing up at 2 in the morning after a burglary. But it seems as though, in this case, you were the one burglarized. Why have you not followed the recommendations of the, of the Office of Inspector General so that you aren't the mark? Um, again, uh, it is, it, I, I want to say that it is a brave women of, of a, men and women of ATF who do do this. That's not a, a well, I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. They're getting day. robbed on one hand, so you can't keep a hold of the guns you're supposed to have, but then you do keep a hold of a bunch of stuff you're not supposed to have a hold of. We, the GAO report, firearms data, ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. As a result of breaking the law, didn't you guys have to go and delete like a quarter of a million records that you illegally kept? Uh, again, uh, with respect to both the Inspector General reports that you're talking nope, about. One's Inspector we, General, one's GAO. Well, the, GA, the, the, yep. the, the, the Inspector General report uh, ATF that happened uh, several years ago, more than that. 2022. And ATF, and ATF the has, the, the report, report came out, but the theft, and yeah. ATF has implemented uh, numerous different safety measures with respect to the national uh, destructive brand. Well, I mean, he, I'm, I'm reading to you from the report from last year, Mr. Director. We found that the NDB staff does not currently, currently in 2022, adhere to established operating procedures in place to mitigate risk of firearms being lost and stolen. So I guess I, th that shows an ATF that is not functioning correctly and is not responding to the problems you create. You keep records you're not supposed to. It was a quarter million of them you had to delete, right? Um, I, I don't believe that that is uh, Was it over 200,000 that you had to delete? Uh, so what, what, what was happening was... I just want to know the number of records you had to delete that were not being lawfully, lawfully maintained. There were there were records that were had not actually been searched, but my understanding Hundreds of is thousands were searchable. Of them. And so that's what you guys do. You keep what you shouldn't keep. You lose what you're not supposed to lose. But how do you treat regular Americans? I got this letter from someone in my district, uh, a firearms dealer. I have been a firearms dealer for 46 years. For 46 years, I've had a good relationship with law enforcement. 
Then came the ATF's zero tolerance policy. Two years ago, while in the process of selling a firearm to a customer, I completed their background check using Florida's FDLE firearm purchasing program. The background check was uneventful, and FDLE rendered an approval number. Some months later, during an ATF audit, I was told the background check was now a non-approval. Even though FDLE made the error, it was on my paperwork, so ATF deemed it a willful error. After completing close to 50,000 background checks over 46 years, why would I willfully ignore this background check? The answer is simple, I did not. But the ATF has revoked my license, ended my career, and my livelihood. So I guess the question is, why should you be able to destroy the life of one of my constituents over a technicality where they weren't even at fault when you all lose thousands of guns and illegally keep hundreds of thousands of records? Respectfully, uh, with res Congress has, has given us uh, the authority to inspect and make sure that firearms dealers, the vast majority by the which are compliant, they are our first line of defense. Um, in, in dealing with uh, straw purchases. This guy isn't your first line of defense anymore. He's fired. But a very small uh, minority, those dealers, uh, after due process, uh, have a been A small determined. minority, a small minority, ATF, enforcer of gun laws, lost thousands of firearm parts to thieves. New data shows ATF gun store restrictions at the highest rate in 16 years. Mr. Director, the definition of hypocrisy is when you can't live up to your own standard. So you have imposed a zero tolerance policy that is resulting in the highest rate of revocations in 16 years, and you wouldn't be able to meet your own zero tolerance policy because you lose stuff you're supposed to keep, and then you keep stuff that it's illegal to keep. Uh, and by the way, I am one of those MAGA Republicans that would defund your salary, your agency, and I, don't, I, and I think all these good things that you say exist could happen with those folks at the local and state level, and this is a, is a terrible abuse of power. Um. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank you. Well, we can see now what the GOP has become. It's become the anti-ATF, anti-FBI, anti-law enforcement, uh, pro-insurrection party. Uh, Mr. Director, I appreciate your being here. You have one of the toughest jobs in America. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle treat you like you're some kind of a mass shooter instead of someone trying to protect us from the epidemic of gun violence. And I want to recognize all of the volunteers from Moms and Man Action and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your advocacy around the nation. Um, I appreciate how much you're devoted to trying to end this scourge of gun violence. Um, I thought, I think like many Americans, that after the tragedy of Sandy Hook, it would finally be enough. Watching those beautiful children massacred would be finally enough to prompt this Congress to do something, to stop this insanity. But it didn't. Uh, tragically, so many members of Congress learned a very different lesson that they could just wait it out. They could wait out tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And they would have to do nothing. Uh, and indeed, on the other side of the aisle, it's just gotten worse. It's just gotten worse. Whenever you see a disparity between what the American people want and what they get, there's usually a powerful special interest uh, at work. And here, the American people desperately want an end to this epidemic. They want common sense gun safety legislation. They want a ban on assault weapons. They want truly universal background checks. It, it's insane that you can be denied the purchase of a weapon because you're a felon and then go out in the parking lot and buy the same gun. That is insane. And of course, we see the result when we see our children mowed down week after week after week. And it's not like there aren't answers to this. It's not like there aren't things that work. There are things that work, like a ban on assault weapons and a ban on high-capacity clips. And yes, it won't stop every shooting, it won't stop every mass shooting, but it'll stop a lot of them, and it'll make the ones that happen far less lethal. I mean, the GOP has become the party of wanting guns with more lethality, capable of killing more people, capable of killing more kids and more cops. And I'm sure 
They don't actually want cops and kids to die, but it's the effect of their actions, it's the effect of their inaction that people are dying. I mean, not even NRA members want this. And so why, uh, why do they? Who benefits from this? Who benefits from this, this, this absurd, grotesque spectacle of, of mass shootings week after week and the daily trauma of people getting gunned down? Who benefits? Certainly not the American people. Well, the gun makers benefit. It's all about the money. Apparently, it's all about the money. Nothing else matters. I've been carrying a bill now for, for six or eight years to repeal the immunity that the gun industry has. Because if it's all about the money, then the only thing that will, will stop the violence is to take away the money, take away the profit in murder. So I, I'm grateful to, to Mama's Demand Action. I'm grateful for what you're doing out there. You're making a difference. If not in this building, you're making a difference in state capitals. I think you're going to make a difference in this building. We will get to a tipping point where we will show that we can, we can beat the NRA, we can pass common sense reforms, and we can protect the public. You know, there, there has been a lot of progress, I think, on the Democratic side of the aisle to, of members running towards this issue, not away from it. But on the other side of the aisle, after that terrible shooting in Buffalo, for example, a year or two ago, when one of the Republican members said they could no longer in good conscience oppose an assault weapons ban, it was a few days later they were forced to announce that they would not run again because they were told basically that they would be drummed out of the party. And that has got to change. We're just going to see more Americans die from the lack of courage in this building. But I, I am just so fed up with getting up every day and seeing another city devastated, another town, another school known not for the beauty of its people, but for the deadliness of another tragedy. You've got to do better than this. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Chair, and I'll recognize himself for five minutes. Mr. Dettelbach, are, are you troubled by the rule? I mean, you told him one thing 10 years ago, and now you're directly contradicting that. Uh, the, the, uh, stable, the stabilizing brake short barrel rifle rule, I assume, is the rule you're, you're referring I'm, I'm to. I'm referring to the letter that was sent back on November 26, 2012, that Mr. Nell's referenced in his first line of questioning, where sure. you, told, so, you uh, told the FTB finds that the submitted brace, when attached to a forearm, excuse me, a firearm, does not convert. Or just know that you continue, your presence continuing to show up, continuing to speak, continuing letting us see you, letting people see you. Just know, even if it means you saved one life, that's a life that you save. You're saving lives. So I just want to remind you all that, um, that your work is not in vain. Uh, uh, St. Louis and I are here today to talk about accountability for gun violence, um, for this epidemic that continues to ravage our communities and our country. As my colleagues have pointed out, we lose a, approximately 120 people in this country every single day to gun violence. And firearm-related incidents are the leading cause of death for children and for teenagers in the United States. And that has been okayed. Actually, we've given it like a red carpet. This is no coincidence. It is the obvious consequence of dangerous policies in Republican-controlled states that flood, our gun, that flood our streets with guns and enable mass shootings that shatter families and destroy lives. I know this personally as someone who has survived and been traumatized myself by gun violence. But the Republicans are desperate to make ATF a distraction from their pathetic and shameful obedience to the NRA that's getting people killed. That obedience is having a devastating impact on communities around our country. Director Dettelbach, thank you for being here, and I'd like to ask you, yes or no, would you agree that the states with the weakest laws restricting gun ownership have Republican legislatures? I'm talking about Missouri, Alaska, Wyoming, Montana, uh, Mississippi. Respectfully, it is not my role to, to talk about the, these kinds of questions in my law enforcement role. Well, I will say, I can tell you that a recent study by Everytown comprehensively documents the states with the weakest gun laws. The weakest gun laws, the states with the weakest gun laws are overwhelmingly Republican states. Yes or no, Director, would you agree that these states have some of the highest rates of gun violence? Uh, and again, um, I'm not 
there to take issue with any of the data that you said, but in my role as running a law enforcement agency, we take the laws that are passed by legislatures like Congress and we implement them as best we can to protect people. Others have that debate and will continue to, of course. It's an important discussion. I'm not minimizing it. In my current role, it's just not part of what I'm focused on doing. Well, thank you for that. Um, and they do. For example, in my home state of Missouri, which is a Republican state, it is among the 10 states with the highest rates of gun deaths in the country, the highest rates of gun deaths and the weakest gun laws in the country. This is a state that Donald Trump won. And yes or no, um, Director, would you agree that lax gun policies in certain states have resulted in firearms flooding municipalities that are unable to override those state-level policies? And, uh, again, respectfully, I don't know the details of all that, but it wouldn't be in my role as ATF director, as a law enforcement officer, to, to become involved in debates in state, state policy matters. Communities like St. Louis experience the brunt of gun violence, this epidemic, because of state level policies in Missouri and elsewhere that fail to enact common sense gun laws to keep our communities safe. Republicans failure to act is deadly. We've seen it over and over again, it's deadly. Less than six months uh, ago- Obviously the original we had a hearing's a lot longer, we've cut it down, but something, just listening to that, uh, I don't get. It's almost like certain politicians who are literally in the shadow of Jim Jordan, don't want to actually do anything about safety really don't you can listen to that again and again and again and the underlying feeling that you get is safety is not the most important part of the hearing and of the debate and of the questioning it's just politics how can you put politics before safety i would love to be in a situation where jim jordan is made to explain directly to a family or somebody who has been victim of a really, really bad scenario or incident, why politics is more important than safety.